Hello, everybody. Oh, no. Hello. Oh, there we go. Hey, everybody. Uh, yeah, happy happy Labor Day. Uh, Labor Day afternoon as the con winds down. Glad you're uh, still sticking around, coming out to the panels here. Uh, so my name is Kurt Opsahl. I am the Deputy Executive Director and General Counsel at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. EFF is a nonprofit organization dedicated to defending rights online, so fighting for privacy, free expression, innovation, fair use. We do this through impact litigation, through grassroots activism, and by producing some freedom-enhancing technologies, and we're trying to make the world a, a place that we would want to live in. Um, so the topic today is, is, uh, is embarrassing a public official a hacking crime and you know this there, there's a pretty good and short answer to that no uh, but nevertheless uh, sometimes uh, political officials do uh, threaten uh, ha hacking crimes so uh, one of the uh, the incidents uh, that happened uh, not too not too long ago along this lines was in uh, Missouri where uh, a newspaper reporter uh, was looking at an education, uh, a, you know, a Missouri educational government website, uh, and uh, looked at the source code. Uh, and in that source code found that uh, it was making information available that shouldn't have been made available, some uh, social security numbers of teachers. Um, and uh, before publishing the, the story about this, the journalist uh, reported this uh, to the, uh, the uh, uh, website operators. Um, and then at first, uh, things were, were going uh, fairly well. Uh, speak, speaking to some of the uh, IT staff there, trying to you know, uh, explain what the, what the issue is and, and hopefully get it fixed. And this is sort of how, uh, how things can go very, very smoothly. Um, but uh, eventually, this shifted, uh, and the, uh, the the governor of Missouri, who you know was maybe a political opponent of the newspaper, or at least you know they had some tussles about the reporting, was not not a fan, uh, accused the journalists of violating hacking law uh, in the course of their uh, their reporting. Um, and uh, uh, this you know, sometimes was uh, referred to uh, in, in some of the tech press as the, the F12 case, uh, F12 being the key for, you know, view source. And, you know, it uh, led to some uh, uh, slogans like F12 is not a crime. Um, and uh, uh, but nevertheless, uh, despite this sort of ridicule of uh, uh, people that, you know, sort of the notion that, uh, looking at source code could could be a crime. Uh, nevertheless, the governor persisted. Um, so, is it a crime? Well, uh, ultimately, what happened there was that after a lot of like rhetoric in the in the public press, uh, the 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 case was ultimately uh, referred to to a, uh, a local district attorney in the in that jurisdiction. Um, which is, you know, a, it's an elected position, so you know, a political position in that sense. But uh, it was not uh, as, uh, I guess, tied to the partisan uh, a aspects of this. So this is, you know, considered to be somewhat of a, of a good sign to have it. Though, you know, better thing would have been not to refer it. Uh, and after uh, considering it for what I thought was to be, uh, you know, longer than was strictly necessary to to figure this out. The uh, uh, district attorney ultimately declined to to file charges, and so that went away. Um, but uh, the there was at least you know some interesting questions, um, and when we lawyers uh, talk about interesting questions, that means that sometimes it is you know it's unclear how how things will go if they go badly. Um, so. For a moment, I, I want to step back and say that, that, that in most states, including, including Missouri, and I think probably all states, there are both a, uh, you know, if an alleged hacking crime could be a violation of either the federal anti-hacking law, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, or the state equivalent. Um, and the state equivalent 
uh, is is often you know structured similarly to the the federal uh, one, but uh, doesn't necessarily have uh, have the the same wording. Um, so under under federal hacking law, um, and, you know, like I said, that, that is the one I'm you know the most familiar, uh, and there's actually a fair amount of case law that uh, helps interpret the federal anti-hacking law. Uh, and recently, there was a Supreme Court case, the first Supreme Court ca- case to deal with, with hacking law. Um, and that case, Van Buren versus the United States, uh, was actually would be quite helpful in clarifying that F-12 was not a crime. Um, so I'll, let me give you a little bit of the, the history of, of that case and, and what, what, uh, what led up to it. Um, one of the the theories that had been uh, put forward by uh, prosecutors, the, you know, the Department of Justice and the local United States attorneys in various uh, districts throughout the United States, uh, were were pushing a theory that um, without authorization, that's the key word in in this is either exceeding authorized access or without authorization. I guess these are two two prongs, and that's. The, the, the gist of the crime is, you know, accessing a computer without authorization or exceeding your authorized access. And from a sort of a technical point of view, we would say like, like accessing it without authorization would be somehow defeating a like you know, password mechanism or getting you know, onto a machine uh, by uh, defeating the uh, authentication uh, measures. Uh, and exceeding authorized access would be that, like, if you were authorized as a you know regular user, but you were able to uh, you know get uh, admin privileges, get root on the uh, machine, you know, uh, privilege escalation, uh, then that would be exceeding authorized access. But the uh, the expansive theory was that if you uh, had come to a, a website uh, that had a set of terms of use. That if you violated those two terms of use, those were the things that gave you authorization to be on that website. And if you violated them, well, you are no longer authorized. Et voila, you have committed a hacking crime. And this this uh, was used in a couple instances in which there was somebody that the uh, uh, DOJ wanted to go after. Uh, and this was the... I guess, available means. So one of the first cases uh, along these lines was uh, a case involving a woman by the name of Lori Drew. Uh, Lori Drew was a uh, a mother whose uh, child, teenager child, was being uh, harassed uh, online uh, on a uh, a social media service. Um, And I think it was MySpace, if I recall correctly. Uh, and uh, so the, the mother got on and impersonated uh, another teenage girl and uh, was sort of harassing back the harasser. Uh, and, you know, this may be not the best uh, mothering strategy to, to deal with the situation, but that's what she did. But unfortunately, uh, this led to the original harasser committing suicide. And this was quite, you know, a tragedy. Uh, but under uh, the the locally available law, there there didn't seem to be any law that that fit to sort of punish this tra- you know bad act, this this tragic circumstance. Uh, and so a uh, United States attorney, uh, not in the jurisdiction where this occurred, but rather in Los Angeles, where uh, MySpace was was headquartered, brought a hacking uh, crime allegation under the theory that impersonating somebody was violating the terms of use. The terms of use said something like, you know, you have to give your real name. Uh, you have to be honest about who you are. And so by violating those, uh, what Lori Drew was hacking um, onto the, the, the computer. Now, that, that ultimately, that theory was not was not successful, uh, but, but, you know, for, for good reason. Um, and you know, to illustrate some of the the examples of this, one of my favorites is uh, there's a magazine, Seventeen magazine, that is a, a fashion magazine aimed for for teenagers, uh, and uh, uh, 
either, which uh, uh, 17 is perhaps aspirational, like they are uh, uh, not uh, aimed at people older than 17 who want to look like 17-year-olds, but uh, younger teenagers who want to look like 17-year-olds. In any event, they have, a, uh, an, uh, for a long time, I don't know if they still have it, but they had a terms of use that said, you must be over the age of 18 to use this site. Uh, and so the you know, vast majority of their audience, if they went to the 17 Magazine site, would be committing a hacking crime under this, uh, under this theory. Uh, and th this, this law uh, developed, there are some other cases uh, that uh, were, were providing uh, uh, similar, you know, uh, like basic theories that, you know, violating the terms. Sometimes uh, in, in the case of uh, someone who was authorized but then was, was misusing it. And in the, the Ninth Circuit, that's the uh, sort of the west coast of the United States, Alaska and Hawaii, uh, the, the law developed so that... Uh, if you uh, violating the the terms uh, alone was not enough to uh, to create a, a hacking crime, uh, but if there was a specific notice, a cease and desist letter saying you in particular are not authorized to uh, come to our site anymore, then an otherwise available to any one site could make it that after that letter accessing the site again was uh, was was a hacking crime uh, and then uh, you know some of the debate was also like what of the extent of, of technical measures so uh, for example there was the the, the theory of uh, uh, if you had a, a site and you were trying to block somebody by blocking their IP address and then they changed their IP address to come on was that was that hacking our view was no uh, that uh, that would be that would be a very bad result if people go you know they you come here to Dragon Con you get onto the hotel Wi-Fi and you know you have a different IP address than you were at home if you you know change uh, uh, to a, to a cafe nearby you might use their Wi-Fi and have yet another IP address so this would mean that someone uh, could be you know uh, committing hacking crimes you know just by getting onto a local uh, local Wi-Fi. Uh, out in the uh, 11th Circuit, which we are in, in right now, uh, however, there was a, a uh, appellate court case that uh, uh, was finding that someone who, who violated the, the rules uh, was uh, you know, guilty of a hacking crime. There were a couple cases there, but uh, one of them was this Van Buren case. So uh, Sergeant Van Buren was a police officer here in Georgia. Uh, and uh, it was probably not, you know, the, the best police officer. Um, w one of the things, you know, he developed some chummy relationships with uh, uh, some of the criminal elements around town uh, and then uh, uh, would uh, uh, also try and get some, some money out of them uh, and uh, uh, for favors. And there was uh, one guy who, like, he had, uh, was trying to shake down for for some money, uh, and uh, uh, that guy, while perhaps a uh, not you know, uh, entirely lawful uh, uh, in all of his activities, this was was too much. So he decided to take this uh, to uh, I believe it was the GBI, uh, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, uh, and ended up doing doing a sting. So uh, Sergeant Van Buren uh, eventually worked out a deal where for uh, $5,000 he was going to look up a license plate in the police uh, database and the, the uh, ostensible reason for it was this guy was uh, suspicious that a dancer at a, a strip club was actually an undercover officer. And he wanted uh, Van Buren to, to check out the information of her, her license plate to determine uh, if uh, she was an undercover officer or not. Uh, and so uh, Van, Van Buren did that uh, and then was, was busted as, uh, for the sting. Now, you can say there's many things that are wrong with that, you know, like you know, taking a bribe, misusing police resources, uh, theft of honest services. There's a wide variety of things that were bad about what Van Buren did here. It was, uh, uh, while in fact it was a sting, so like, you know, no, 
nobody's actual uh, information was harmed in the creation of this sting. Uh, he was certainly intending to do something, which would be a you know fairly egregious privacy violation and interfering with a you know undercover investigation potentially. But they also charged him with a hacking crime, and that was an exceeds authorized access hacking crime. And so uh, uh, the theory went that uh, he was authorized to use the uh, database for lawful investigations for for police use only. Uh, and by using it for a non-police use, you know, personal enrichment through bribery, uh, that he, that was not an authorized use. Uh, and so, therefore, he was exceeding his authorized access through this use. Uh, and uh, that that case um, went up to the, uh, the Supreme Court because we had some cases out in the Ninth Circuit that were saying that, you know, you couldn't do this kind of theory where, where you know, violating the, uh, the, this contract uh, like thing or, or you know, use restrictions were enough to make you unauthorized and the Eleventh Circuit was saying that it was uh, and that's one of the reasons why the Supreme Court might take a case is when there's a split in the, the authority. Uh, so uh, the Supreme Court uh, held that uh, this was not a hacking crime. And uh, they, they explained out their, their theories uh, uh, so much. Their, the, you know, the, the, the big uh, phrase that came out of that was um, whether the, uh, the gates were up or down. Uh, and uh, they, they actually they wrote this opinion talking a lot about gates uh, up and down. They never really explained whether up or down was the open direction, so whether it was a portcullis or a drawbridge. Uh, I'm going with portcullis, so uh, if the gates are up, then the, the door is open. But the, 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 you could definitely get the point from this is that when the gates were uh, unbarred and, and, and available for someone to pass through, if it was a available thing that no one had to uh, do anything special to get through, then they were not doing a hacking crime and that subsequent misuse of that information, in this case for, for you know fraudulent services and bribery, uh, didn't change the way that the, uh, the gates were. Uh, this, you know, to, uh, um, uh, was a very important reinterpretation or, or clarification, I guess you'd say, a clarification of the CFAA because it, it really, uh, pushed back against the, uh, this theory that would allow, uh, violations of terms of, now this was an exceeds authorized access. Earlier I was mentioning there were two prongs. There's also a without authorization prong where you don't have authorization to be there in, in the first place. Um, and so the, the court, uh, in, in my, my view, you know, I think that reasoning could be applied, but strictly speaking, you know, the court only rules on the specific thing that is in, in front of it. Um, in addition, the, the court left another issue for uh, a, a different day, uh, which is they had a footnote eight. And footnote eight said, uh, we are not deciding whether it has to be a violation of a technical measure. Uh, one of the things that EFF had been pushing for, we, we had an amicus brief in the case, was that it had to be a violation of a, of a technical member, that the hacking uh, is, should be a, 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 you know, a technical violation. Um, but uh, uh, despite leaving that, that footnote, uh, a lot of the decision was, was pointing out how uh, like it would be you know, if you made it so uh, uh, you know, uh, if you were 18 and you went to the 17 magazine, it was a crime or uh, uh, referencing to, to uh, an earlier case, which found it not, not to be a crime. There was one of you, know, uh, this is a quote from uh, the Ninth Circuit case, but uh, if you're, uh, uh, if you say you're tall, dark, and handsome, um, but you're actually, uh, you know, short and ugly on a dating site, uh, you know, I, that, that shouldn't be a, a, a hacking crime. Uh, and the, the Supreme Court decision did a lot of referencing to the problems that would occur if you have these sort of civil contracts that were being enforced by criminal laws, the CFAA being both a civil and, and criminal uh, uh, statute. 
uh, that, that it would seem that if you were like reading the reasoning of the Van Buren case, that they were, were pointing out all these examples of non-technical barriers that they didn't think would be a, a good reason for it. Uh, but sometimes this happens with Supreme Court decisions where they, they you know, uh, need to craft as larger, they want to craft as large a majority as possible. And it may be that, that somebody was like, that's an issue that I'm not comfortable deciding today. We don't need to decide it. We need to have a footnote to clarify that that's not decided. Uh, so, uh, and, and one other, uh, thing that happened at the same time, this was actually, there were two Supreme Court cases that were looking at the CFAA up at the same time. The other one was High Q versus LinkedIn. Uh, High Q, uh, was a scraper. Uh, no, that was actually, there was a panel, uh, yesterday that was dealing with some of the issues around, uh, High Q and, and scraping. Uh, so Haiku Q went to LinkedIn. It scraped the publicly available uh, information uh, on on LinkedIn, uh, and LinkedIn didn't like that. They they wanted Haiku Q to uh, to stop doing it. Um, and the uh, this was out in the in the Ninth Circuit, uh, and the Ninth Circuit uh, uh, determined that uh, uh, that was not. A hacking crime to scrape LinkedIn's uh, available uh, website. Uh, the Supreme Court did not decide uh, the high Q case. Uh, instead, they do something they often often do if they have some similar cases. They decided Van Buren, and then with high Q, they said Ninth Circuit, go look at it again in light of what we just said in Van Buren. Uh, and in that case, it was a uh, unauthorized access, not an exceeding authorized access case. So this would be, you know, they, they became high Q, sort of the first case to, at the appellate level, deal with the, uh, the results of Van Buren uh, and apply it uh, or, or see whether it changed the result uh, for a uh, access without authorization case. So uh, the Ninth Circuit, re-reviewed it, they had another round of argument, another round of briefing, we filed another amicus brief, um, and uh, uh, that went well, from, from our point of view at least. Uh, uh, the, uh, the court agreed that they were right before, and that Van Buren didn't change that, that how that they were previously right, um, which uh, uh, helps extend and at least clarify uh, where it comes. And so, how does this all uh, uh, relate to what we're, we're talking about, which is both of these cases are about when you are looking at available information that doesn't have any barriers to you accessing it. And in, in the, the case of looking at source code, there are no barriers. The, the, you know, your, your computer requests the page, the page provides the source code, and then your computer interprets that code. But like you are being given that source code by the, the computer uh, and so it not only is not hacking, it is actually the natural operation of the computer to provide the source code. So there, there was a, a pretty, pretty uh, a good reason to believe that uh, there was no federal hacking crime involved. But there was a Missouri statute. And uh, the, the governor, at least, was, was putting forth a uh, interpretation of this that uh, under the Missouri law, this could still be, uh, still be a crime. Um, and one of the things that they, uh, they keyed on was that the social uh, security numbers were obfuscated. Uh, obfuscated in a uh, trivial way, uh, so it was not like, encrypted uh, in any uh, you know, uh, serious uh, attempt, but you had to uh, be able to interpret the code a little bit to, to see what they were, and an interpretation that is a widely known thing that happens all the time. Uh, so I, again, would, would say that that does not turn taking some information that was provided to you and turn it into a hacking crime if you, uh, uh, I, I forget exactly what the obfuscation was. It might have been base 64 encoding or something like that. It was encoded, not encrypted. Uh, but that created enough 
question, or, or uh, doubt at least, to be a very scary thing for the reporter involved. That you know, uh, fortunately, they worked for a, a major uh, paper there who was able to you know hire them them counsel. But for uh, a period of, of many months, they had to wonder if they were going to get charged with this uh, this crime and have to make what I think would have been very good and likely successful arguments that, uh, you know, the, the governor's uh, interpretation of the law was wrong. Uh, but uh, th this sort of illustrates one of the challenges involved with uh, some of these uh, hacking statutes and their language, which is sometimes un unclear. And with the case of state laws, there's not a whole body of interpretive uh, cases to help clarify some of that language. There may be very few published cases at all about that. And to sort of put that into perspective, if you think you're, you know, you're very likely to be to win, to be correct, that it wasn't a crime, that it wasn't a problem, uh, you know, like 95 percent chance. It's like rolling a D20, and if you roll above a one, you're going to win. That's a very confident uh, uh, chance of what you're doing. But if you do roll that one, and it means you might go, you know, uh, uh, with a felony record and, uh, you know, get, get five years, you know, out, out into good behavior, that is a, still a very big chance to take on, on a, you know, a roll of the dice. And also in the meantime, having to go through being on trial, being on things. Uh, which is also why uh, you probably have seen this in, in, in many criminal cases, almost all of them. There's a plea bargain because the government will say, well, do you want to roll the dice at, at trial or we'll give you something less? But then you're guaranteed 100 percent to have a criminal record. and such. So it's a even if you are likely to be successful, it is a pretty tough thing to be to be in that situation and charged with a crime. And so uh, this this is why it is it is a pretty terrible thing for government officials to be threatening uh, security researchers or journalists who have uncovered security flaws, reported them, and suggest that this this may be a, a chargeable offense. Um, and why is this sort of really bad from a public policy standpoint? Because it discourages reporting about the or security violations. That if somebody discovers it, uh, what you want from a public policy point of view, if someone discovers a vulnerability, you want them to report that vulnerability to someone who's in a position to fix it. Um, and you know, you may not want, uh, from as the recipient's point of view, for them to have a big newspaper article about how embarrassing it is that you had this flaw. Sure. Uh, but that is still, it is better to get it fixed because you'd rather have an embarrassment of someone discovering the flaw and the story about how it was discovered and fixed than the story that you might have later, which is that all these records were you know, found on a dark web website and because somebody else had found that flaw, but instead of reporting it, exploited the, the flaw. So as a, uh, as a potential recipient, as a, as a government who is trying to make things more secure, you want to have a good path for reporting it and having a, a method for getting it fixed uh, and, and getting it, getting it uh, uh, resolved. And also that helps with the story. The story that would come out after that is, uh, you know, if, if things had gone according to plan, uh, the, the article would have been, there is this flaw. We talked to them about it, and they fixed it. Here it is, and that's a, a story in which the, uh, the provider can look, you know, reasonable and reasonably good. Uh, so I think uh, uh, this, this process, uh, at least in, in that Missouri case, has made it so that, you know, someone has to think twice about reporting a... Uh, a flaw uh, discovered in a Missouri uh, government website, um, and you know this. This says um, there have been uh, you know. So look, that was a one that that got it got sort of big in the news. It's not the only one that 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 uh, I, I have heard of. Uh, you know, at, 
at county level officials. I think have uh, sometimes been you know embarrassed about flaws. There was one out of Chicago where a uh, sheriff's office had a a flaw. Uh, on the security of their ankle monitors. So, uh, you know, if people are released on their own recognizance but are, are still being watched, they sometimes have to wear this uh, ankle monitor uh, to check to see that they don't uh, leave the, the jurisdiction and check in every day. Uh, but there was uh, a bunch of data that was coming out of that monitors that was uh, in, not secured. Uh, and uh, when a, a researcher tried to uh, to report that, uh, in that case, their you know first uh, uh, instinct uh, was to try to suppress this uh, this information from going public again to avoid the the embarrassment. Uh, a number of years back uh, here here in Georgia, some people discovered that there was a. Uh, if I'm recalling uh, correctly, uh, an insecure uh, voter registration database uh, and attempted to report that. Uh, and uh, after a few attempts to, to report that and got that fixed, that became a politicized thing and they were accused of, of doing some, some hacking as opposed to having uh, uh, discovered it. Uh, and again, all of, all of these sort of types of behaviors, while sort of understandable in the sense that you know, no one likes to be embarrassed, are uh, what we need to fight against as a public policy matter in trying to make our systems uh, more secure. So, um, so we've gone about, I've uh, been monologuing here for, for about a half hour, so uh, I think I'll, I'll take a moment to see if anybody has any uh, questions about, about hacking law, about uh, vulnerability uh, reporting policy. Uh, anything that they would like to bring up? So the question was, uh, for, you know, on, not on the mic, so I'll repeat the question. How does this uh, compare to slap suit? So uh, first of all, let me uh, say slap, strategic lawsuit against public participation, S-L-A-P-P. Uh, and a uh, that is an acronym that that came up uh, in the I think it was in the 70s or so uh, as a uh, in the form of statutes anti-slap statutes uh, and anti-slap statutes were designed to get rid of uh, uh, quickly get rid of lawsuits that were designed to harass. So the the impetus of this was uh, came from environmental law. Uh, that uh, uh, sometimes uh, 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 environmental activists were uh, uh, sued uh, by the you know uh, alleged environmental violator, often in the form of uh, defamation, uh, and uh, uh, the the suits were designed to silence people by the threat of a lawsuit. Now, as it turns out, we have, I think, uh, a, uh, you know, a lot of things I, I like about our justice system, but one of the problems with it uh, is that it's expensive. Uh, and if some uh, a rich company uh, has a lot of resources and a environmental activist is, does not, uh, to defend against a defamation suit uh, is a pretty terrible thing. And they were trying to use these suits to get people to shut up uh, because they couldn't handle the costs of uh, defense. So the, the anti-slap laws changed uh, how the procedure went in those cases so that if somebody uh, filed a slap suit... Uh, that had certain characteristics that someone was speaking out uh, on a public issue uh, and was, uh, was a defamation charge and such, that in order for the case to proceed beyond the a very initial stage, the, the person filing it had to prove up to the judge that they had a good case. Uh, and so it allowed uh, for... A early motion, an uh, anti-slap motion, to get rid of the case very quickly, and 
the uh, if you were successful as the you know, uh, a victim of a slap suit, then the other side, the the bad guys in this scenario who are trying to silence people with their lawsuits would have to pay your legal fees with the notion that that would help uh, uh, in, make it viable for uh, these defendants who didn't have a lot of resources to get an attorney who would be willing to do it with the prospect of getting their, their fees paid uh, in the end. Um, and uh, actually many of these, these slap uh, laws were uh, extended it was originally, you know, I said for, for, for environmental purposes, but a lot of them uh, were extended towards uh, uh, any kind of suits that were trying to stop somebody from uh, publicly participating. So uh, I have not seen a circumstance in which uh, it has... So in the CFAA has a civil thing. So would the slap anti-slap legislation wouldn't do anything about a criminal charge, what we were talking about before with like the public official demure government. But because it is a, you know, a civil statute as well, uh, there certainly have been other cases in which a uh, commercial vendor, you know, the supplier of the equipment, has uh, uh, sued uh, or threatened to, to sue for CFAA violations uh, in order to uh, discourage a... Uh, uh, security researcher from uh, proceeding with their uh, disclosing their their findings um, I'm gonna have a, a little side note this doesn't work out very well uh, if you file a civil lawsuit with all the allegations of they said this and they said the other thing about our security being terrible even if you say at the end and this is totally false and wrong there will be a news article about the lawsuit and your security uh, uh, violations. And if you're trying to keep something quiet, uh, making a, a, a federal case out of it is, is not the best strategy for, for keeping things quiet. And a number of companies have found out to their dismay that uh, uh, their attempt to, to create silence about things ultimately backfired. This, this is a, there's a, term coined uh, by uh, uh, Mike Masnick at TechDirt over this, the Streisand effect, uh, which is that Barbara Streisand had done a, a privacy suit over somebody uh, doing an, uh, taking some photos of her house uh, and an overflight, and so she sued uh, the people who did this. And, uh, you know, one of the side effects is that is that there was now all these stories about uh, her house, where it was, what the house looked like, you know, pictures and such, because, you know, it was that that was illustrating the story. And so it was the exact opposite of, of how to how to try and you know, succeed in that. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, people people have done this. Um, so slap statutes are, you know, they're not available for every type of, of lawsuits, and they are designed for when it is somebody uh, um, speaking. And so you could totally do a slap lawsuit for a uh, hacking disclosure issue if their threat was defamation, if their threat was, you say I have a security flaw, that is false and defamatory, I don't really have a security flaw. Uh, and then, uh, you know, that would be a factual matter. Um, you know, is there, in fact, a security flaw? And then you could use a slap suit, and they would have to, you know, show some evidence that there, in fact, wasn't a security flaw to survive the slap. I mean, or you could have a slap suit if it was uh, going after, uh, you know, constitutionally protected opinion speech, which also is something. So if you were mad, I was doing a, a security flaw and said something like, you know, these people couldn't code their way out of a paper bag. Uh, and they say, no, in fact, we can code our way out of a paper bag. And I say, no, that is an opinion. There's not, you know, it's not a provable fact whether you can code your way out of a paper bag. You don't code to get out of paper bags. Uh, and, you know, it would be dismissed as constitutionally protected opinion speech and you win your slap suit. But it wouldn't really help with your CFAA suit, and here's why, is because this, this happens a lot when security research that there are two things going on. One is the act that you did to discover the security flaw, and the second is the act that you're doing to disclose the flaw. 
And in most security vulnerability disclosure scenarios, you have all sorts of good, solid constitutional protections for the act of disclosing truthful information about a security flaw. It would be, you know, if they tried to stop you, it would be a prior restraint. Uh, and uh, if, as if those are familiar with the uh, uh, Big Lebowski, uh, there is a long history uh, of uh, against prior restraints, uh, and uh, um, so that's that's probably not going to work out, uh, and has the Streisand effect. But that doesn't mean that they can't go after you for uh, the the act that was done in the security research. So. Van Buren is great. We just talked about Q is great in the sense if that you know you know going to say you go to a site, you look at things just like any other user of that site would look at them, you discover a flaw. Voila, you're you're in good. You don't have to worry too much about uh, the the CFAA. Um, absent these you know overcharging situations, but uh, sometimes as a, uh, a security researcher. You know, as they, they say in the Hacker's Manifesto many years ago, my only crime was curiosity. But sometimes that curiosity crime might involve, like, sending some, uh, you know, information into a field that might cause a buffer overflow that uh, allows you to execute some commands, SQL injection, doing some privilege escalation, where people, indeed, curiosity, they don't mean any harm, they're not trying to... to do anything bad but they want to see how secure a, a site is uh, and give it a test and um, you know in, in, in many instances if people do that they go check out a site they might you know use some pen testing tools that are available see if anything is like unpatched and then write up a report and give it to them uh, and many sites, many, many, uh, services will be like, great, thank you. And uh, a lot of times these days they will have a bug bounty program. So, which says that like, these are the kind of reports that are, we would like to see if you, uh, do this well, come on down, we're not going to sue you. And that would be great. But sometimes, uh, they don't have a security vulnerability disclosure program. They don't have, uh, a, a bug bounty program. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, then they, uh, they, they consider threatening to say, you broke into our computers to find this law. You know, you may not have stolen any data or, you know, or destroyed our systems or anything, but because we want to use this as leverage, if you don't shut up about it, will sue you for the, for the hacking itself. And that's where there's sort of that, that tension uh, so we've made a lot of progress in this area, uh, in, in, uh, both with, with vulnerability disclosure programs and, and, and bug bounties that, uh, technically sophisticated companies, you know, tech companies, uh, who operate major websites, they all do this, uh, you know, hardware manufacturers, people who, who work a lot in, uh, in, you know, tech companies, um, where we have seen some some problems where there are sometimes threats of of lawsuits or legal action uh is more frequently in what i might call a uh, a first contact situation uh first contact between the security research community and a industry that hasn't been used to having that community and you know i like you know, they, they put the internet on a surprising number of things. And in, in some cases, uh, it seems like uh, that, you know, someone on, uh, I said, you know, this internet thing, it, it's, you know, maybe it's not a fad after all. We should get some internet on our stuff. And they tell, you know, uh, hey, uh, uh, you know, our, our toasters really could use some internet. Can you put that in there? And the product manager is like, okay, uh, sure. And they, Toss a Wi-Fi chip on there and have it so you can like you know toast your 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 say your toasty uh, levels you know with your phone um, and of course they don't know anything about security security is is not job one or two or three or three hundred fifty five uh, and then they end up putting out a a toaster where somebody could 
uh, you know, log into the toaster with no security uh, using a default password and have your you know, toaster burn down your house. And so then they write up a thing about this and say, you know, uh, you know, uh, XYZ Toaster Co., Ac- Acme Toasters, can burn down your house. And, uh, you know, we, you don't want to get this in the hand of Wiley Coyote. Uh, and they get really worried because, it's like, oh, my God, stories about houses burning down with our toasters. This will be disastrous. And, like, their, their institutional memory is is of, of like, you know, uh, uh, product liability for toasters that burn down the house and they're like no one would ever do this this is a completely why would anyone burn down the house you're you're creating a bad news story out of nothing you better be quiet about this or, or we'll sue you and that that kind of scenario um but uh, as you know uh, uh so we'll still see this with the internet of of things as as uh, you know people are internetizing uh more and more more things but as those industries uh, get get used to the the wonderful world of, of computer security, and uh, we'll get we'll get better at it. Um, and uh, there's also um, uh, turning into like bug bounties. On uh, the plus side, uh, there are a lot more bug bounty programs, both run directly by companies, uh, and then uh, there's also some service providers, uh, prominently Bug Crowd and Hacker One, which run programs uh, for for companies. So it makes it relatively easy for a company to uh, to set up a bug bounty program. This is still imperfect, and it's imperfect in a couple of ways. Uh, one way that it is imperfect uh, is that uh, run, having a bug bounty program is not the end of the story. It's not a magic wand where you have a bug bounty program and then soon you have all your bugs fixed. Uh, you also have to have a lot of security resources that will take the reports that come from the program, action them into actual mitigations and fixes for the product in a timely manner. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of infrastructure that is necessary that, that some companies don't do, but at least they allow the, the reporting of the, uh, uh, of the vulnerability with less concern about, uh, uh, being a, a, a violation of the laws. Um, and, uh, uh, the other thing is unfortunately for a lot of these bug bounty programs, part of the deal, if you want to get the money, uh, is a non-disclosure term. So they are trying to achieve that result that previously was done with threats about uh, uh, you know uh, lawsuits with a a term by hey you know we'll give you five hundred bucks for this bug you know two thousand for that bug whatever but. Uh, all of them come with a non-disclosure agreements, and the kinder and gentler ones are non-disclosure for a period of time or until we get it fixed. Uh, but there are definitely some which are non-disclosure until some future point at our sole discretion, uh, and that is uh, uh, you know unfortunate because one of the things that that is critical for the development of security research. Uh, you know, I go to a lot of security researchers' conventions, and it's the talks where people said, here's how I found this flaw. Here's how you can avoid programming that flaw into your next thing. And uh, a lot of times the vulnerabilities found in one system are um, they're going to be similar vulnerabilities in a different a class of vulnerabilities which is discovered, but it just happens to be discovered on a particular vendor. So if you have a presentation about it, you know, go through the method of discovery, then people can then try that method of discovery on other similar products, find those vulnerabilities and get them fixed. So this NDA system makes it more difficult. Now, uh, another thing that has been been good in this is uh, some of the uh, large companies have been paying people to go find bugs and report them. They don't need to get any bounties for this because uh, they're getting paid. So Google Project Zero is is an example of this, uh, where Google has a bunch of uh, really good security engineers who are paid to go find bugs all day and then report them. Google has a 90-day uh, uh, disclosure policy, and uh, that's it. You've got to fix it in 90 days, and they're going public at the 90th day. 
uh, you know, whether it's fixed or not. This came up to a, a, a famous showdown a number of years ago uh, between Microsoft and Google, where Google found a flaw in a Microsoft product, and uh, uh, you know, Microsoft had a patch and they were ready to go. But as you may know, if you if you ever work with, with Microsoft products, they had a thing about Patch Tuesday. Uh, and so that every, uh, you know, they, they would only issue patches on Tuesday. And well, the 90th day was not on a Tuesday. And the way it worked out is the 90th day came a couple of days before patch Tuesday. And Google was like, well, the 90th day, here you go. And they disclosed it. Um, and, you know, Microsoft was mad about that. I know a lot of people who will debate one side or the other of this, you know, they maybe should have given them an extra couple of days. It was only an extra couple of days and so on. But I think what Google was trying to do, that the, the reason to do the 90-day deadline is to provide an incentive for someone to get it done. And Microsoft was saying, ah, you wouldn't dare do that to us. And so Google was trying to set that parameter as, nope, we would dare do that to Microsoft, and they should have issued it the previous Tuesday. Uh, but in any event, and uh, one of the things, one of the reasons why that's a good thing for the world and not just for like Google products uh, is that uh, they use a lot of open source software at Google and they, one of the problems is that uh, open source projects don't have the resources to have a, you know, bug bounty program of any, of any note. Uh, uh, you know, financially at least, uh, and uh, so paying some researchers and paying some, sometimes people also do bug bounties for open source software that they rely on to get that, uh, uh, get that fixed. All right, I'll give another uh, round. Any, any other uh, any, uh, questions? Yeah, in the, in the back. Uh, or you can come up to the mic if you, if you want, or I'll repeat the question if you're comfortable sitting where you are. All right. Um, so, okay, the, the question was, uh, I'll just repeat the question about right to repair, the context of right to repair. So uh, right to repair is, is the name for uh, the, the issues surrounding uh, when you get a piece of equipment, uh, like, for example, a John Deere tractor. Uh, and it uh, it breaks down, and there are some uh, electronic uh, parts with firmware and software and such on it that uh, you might want to repair it. Or uh, uh, you know, also this comes up in the context of cars, and you know, a modern car uh, is very hard to repair because there's so much electronics on it, and uh, you know, they might have you know the John Deere dealership, the Volkswagen dealership, and such. There's a, like a scanner that will read codes from it that speak in a special language and that you know they sort of try to make it so that it is difficult for you to repair a product that you own and uh, unless you pay the dealer to fix it for you this is not uh, as frequently a CFAA problem a hacking law problem so much as a 1201 of the of the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act problem. Uh, the DMCA uh, was uh, an act passed in the in the 90s because the music industry was tired of coming up with DRM, digital rights management uh, software, on at that time uh, compact discs, and having it hilariously fail uh, minutes after they came up with the new standard. Uh, and just, you know, to give you some of the hilarious fails, there was one in which they did this, you know, complex software encryption program or whatever that, that ran uh, on the, the CD. So when you stuck it in a computer, it would boot up this program and, you know, wouldn't allow you to copy the, the music on the CD. Or you could push the shift key and it wouldn't do any executables when you inserted the disk. So... Uh, there was another one where they wrote a, a track that would be read, and they you know got around the, the shift key problem for this one. Uh, and but the answer to this was to use a magic marker and just cover up the track on the optical disc. And so they were they were getting tired of this, uh, and they said, you know what, we're better at legislating than we are at uh, uh, coding DRM. So they went to Congress and passed uh, 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 convinced Congress to pass a law. 
uh, that would say uh, that circumventing technological protection measures, DRM, was unlawful. Uh, and uh, that is what often comes up in the context of right to repair because they say our, our copyrighted work here is protected uh, by uh, digital rights management and you are circumventing it uh, to, to get access to this. Now, the, the other side of this, the DMCA, when it passed a number of places, uh, uh, you know, EFF amongst others, say, oh my God, this is going to be a tremendous problem for all these reasons. And they said, uh, don't worry about it. We'll have the uh, Library of Congress every three years do a rulemaking, and they will make exemptions for all these things that you're complaining about, so you have nothing to worry about. Uh, and so that was it's kind of a stupid way to make a law, to be like, we'll deal with all the problems later. Uh, but that's what they did. Uh, and uh, so there have been some some good movement on uh, uh, some exemptions uh, over the years uh, for for you know repairing uh, things for doing security research in, in certain contexts uh, that you know we would like them to be broader, uh, but there have been some some good victories there, um, and. Uh, uh, this there there are uh, some protections you can have for you know jailbreaking something as the jailbreaking being the the term for being able to get access onto your own device uh, to be able to place whatever software you you wish uh, and so I was just uh, uh, earlier this month at the uh, DefCon uh, uh, hacker conference out in, in Vegas went to a fun presentation there on the uh, John Deere uh, tractor controller where uh, you know, we discussed uh, jailbreaking one of these uh, controllers, which, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, utility for someone who wanted to, you know, repair or update or deal with their, their, their older tractor from, from doing this. But, of course, the, this, it, this being DEF CON and, and uh, trying to make it fun, what did they do in the end? Put Doom on it. And so they made a, uh, a version of Doom that was farming Doom. And so you could be uh, uh, those familiar with Doom. There's a chainsaw that you can get. So they use the chainsaw mechanic as you were driving your, uh, your tractor around Doom and using that to run over the monsters. And then to pick up health items, you would go find some crops and then you know, uh, mow down the crops and that would re recharge your health. Uh, delightful uh, use of that and you know, take a moment to uh, think how much wonder has been brought to the world because id software decided to open source and freely license uh, the doom software many years ago uh, all right that brings us uh, to uh, almost the end of the hour so I think I'll just uh, wrap it there but uh, thank you for for listening and uh, uh, participating in this session I know there's uh, at the end of the day it's uh, good to get people out here and listening so thank you all very much